This episode is sponsored by Honey Badger. In addition to Honey Badger's great error monitoring service, they also have an uptime monitoring for web developers. And Honey Badger has recently shipped an update that allows for public status pages that can help communicate outages to your customers. In addition to your uptime monitoring, Honey Badger now monitors your SSL certificates. And Honey Badger now has actions which will allow you to do bulk updates to all your errors, or you can set defaults for incoming errors. In this episode, we're going to have a look at the source code of Campfire and not a full walkthrough, but really just some of the bits and pieces that I've really liked and I found interesting. Some of it was already known, but I think it's still good to look at them and review some of the different things that's happening. And if you're unfamiliar what Campfire is, it is under the Once umbrella created by 37signals, who also initially created Ruby on Rails. Campfire is a one-time purchase where you pay $300, and then you get to download and run the source code on your own servers. And so while I really don't have a use for Campfire in its current state at the moment, it is something where I still purchase to look at the source code. And there's a lot of things within the source code that they're doing, which is already known and I'm familiar with, but I still think it's good to see how things are organized and structured. And so in this episode, we're going to have a look at some of the items within the source code because I do find it really interesting. And so the first one that I want to look at is actually under the user model. And specifically, when we have these dependent delete alls and dependent destroys, you see that there isn't a consistent use of these. And there's a very good reason for that. When you call a delete all, so if a user is removed, then all of their memberships will also be removed. However, there's no callbacks that are performed when you run a delete all. Instead, it's just going to delete all of the records, and that's going to be much quicker than a dependent destroy. Whereas, on the messages, when you delete the user, their messages will also be removed. However, this is calling a dependent destroy. So if the messages had any kind of callbacks that need to execute whenever the message is deleted, for example, like a broadcast to remove that record from the other user's view, then you would need to make sure that you are calling the dependent destroy instead of delete all. So it's one of those things that as you are developing your application, you want to make sure that the delete all and destroy dependents are correctly being used. As you are making changes in your application, for example, if you're adding a before destroy, around destroy, or after destroy callback, then you want to make sure that you check any of the associations and that you have a dependent destroy instead of delete all. If you did have a delete all, then you would want to change it to destroy but you also want to be careful doing that and you want to test it properly because this could be now a slow point within your application. Another thing that I found interesting within the user model is when a user is deactivated. So the user isn't being deleted, they're just being deactivated. So when a user is deactivated, their memberships are removed, any searches and sessions are also removed, and then we are updating the user record, setting their active to false, but then the email address is getting changed to this method, which is the deactivate email address. So a deactivated user isn't deleted, but their information is still being retained. So any of the messages that they had made will still be retained. You would have to delete the user if you wanted to make sure that all of their messages were also removed. The deactivate email address is just a private method on the user model, and it just takes the email address and it replaces the at symbol with the deactivated with a secure random UUID and then the at symbol again. And so this is pretty cool. And often you might be tempted to just add a dash deactivated, but if you understood and knew that pattern, then you could create a different email address with that dash deactivated and potentially get access back into the system. So by adding the random characters, that's going to help prevent that. And it's not specific to the user model alone, but one thing that I noticed is that within Campfire, there's a lot of concerns. So whenever you see something like included mentionable, role, or transferable, this is referring to a concern. If you look 
Under the Concerns folder, if we scroll up under the Models Concerns, it's actually empty. So where are these actually stored? Well, if you look at the user model, you'll then see the mentionable, role, and transferable. And each one of these are a concern file. But it's kind of interesting on where they put this because each one of these are concerns. However, they're not in the concern folder. Typically, before as I developed, I would just put these under the concerns folder because they are concerns. However, the logic that 37 Signal uses is that they want the user folder with all the concerns to be as close to the user model itself. But when I first heard that, it didn't make much sense to me because of the way my editor is laid out. So I am using Visual Studio Code. And if I go into my settings, which I can do with a command comma, I can then type in the Explorer and then Sort Order. And it's this one right here, the Explorer Sort Order. And if you're using a JSON file or something, it's explore.sortorder. And I'm going to change this to mixed. And by doing this, if we save, you'll see that now my application is laid out very differently. I have my dot files up at the top, and then we have the rest of the application. But what's happening is, instead of all of the folders being at the top, now it's kind of intermingled and sorted by name. So if I go back into our models, and if I look at the user model now, now the user model is very close to the concerns that it's working with. And so I've changed that as a default setting on my editor, and I think I like this. So even though these are concerns, having them very close to the user folder, because these concerns are specific and only used by the user, then this pattern makes sense. And do notice, when I typically name my folders, I do use the pluralized version, but they are using the singular version on these concerns. And then they have the module user mentionable. Within the user model, notice that they did not add a user mentionable, which they could have, and it would have been just fine, but it's a bit redundant because if you include the mentionable here, then it will look for a mentionable at the root level, or it'll look under the user folder and then mentionable. And one thing about that that really doesn't matter too much to me is that my editor, I am able to hover over these to then gain access to them. So having it very close to the user model may not make a whole lot of sense, but it's a pattern that I could get behind. And if I'm switching between the concerns a lot, it could actually be kind of helpful having them pretty close together. And for the next thing that I thought was really interesting was the search functionality. The infrastructure for Campfire is very simple. You have your web server. There is a rescue service, but it doesn't really do too much right now. And then there's also a Redis. The Redis can provide some caching, but it's also the queue manager for rescue. And it's also used for action cable. So there isn't much going on. There really isn't a full text search other than what's provided within SQLite, meaning that Melasearch or Elasticsearch isn't being used in this application. But the search functionality is really neat. So I'm going to do a search for one, two, and I'm just going to go through and do a search all the way down 10 times. And what you'll notice is that as we get down on the right hand side, we have all of our searches and it's starting to delete them. So we get our 10 most recent searches. If we go back, we can actually do a search for some of these posts and then it instantly comes up. So it's really kind of neat how they're doing this functionality. So to try to trace this back, I usually start at the controller level. Under the controllers and the searches, the page that I'm on is the index. So when we first click on the searches, this will be our index or similar, but it's probably easiest to see if I take it out of the PWA and just look at it within Chrome. So you'll see that just come into the search takes us to the searches path. If I were to click on one of these, you'll see that that also takes us to the index, but it also pass in a query param. So it's setting the instance variable query if the query is present. And that query is just taking in the params queue and doing a gsub. It also returns all of the recent searches for the user's searches. And then it's just doing a order. And then we have the ability to just hop back to the last room. And so when this is rendered for the searches, we're getting our recent searches. 
And then we're also getting all of the content or the results from that search. And so that's really neat. And I really like that functionality because when you create a new search, it calls our current user and then the searches. So on our searches model, there should be a method and it should be a class level called record and then the query. So we can pull that up, search.rb under the app models. And we have our class method query, which does a find or create by that query. And then it touches the record. And so it does the touch because if we did recently use that query, then we want it to come back up at the top. And so if the query was created, then an after create callback is triggered, trim recent searches, which is a private method where we are getting all of the searches, excluding the user searches, again, doing an ordered, which is sorting by the updated at descending. We're grabbing the first 10 items and then we're deleting everything. And so here, the excluding is a great use case because now we can just get all the records excluding the top 10 and then we'll delete them. In a perfect world, there should only ever be deleting one record. And so that's pretty neat because doing a search could be something that happens quite often and there wouldn't be any need to store the historical searches that are many weeks or months old if they aren't within the last 10 used. And another thing that I found really interesting is under the memberships. And this is something that I haven't really done myself, but I saw this and I was kind of intrigued by it. So we have an enum for the involvement, which is normal. And the enum is a few different items, but then we have this index by itself. And I really didn't know what that was going to do. So we can actually go into our Rails terminal and we can call the membership dot involvements and we'll just run this you'll see that it just creates a hash where the key is actually the values here. And that's pretty interesting. So what I want to do is I want to go and look under the DB and the schema.rb, but Campfire doesn't use the schema.rb. Instead, it uses a structure SQL. And the main reason why you may want to do that instead of a schema.rb is because the structure SQL may have some kind of queries that otherwise you wouldn't be able to run. So I've seen this a few times, but what I want to look at is this involvement enum because in a recent version of Rails, there was the actual creation of enums within Postgres, but this isn't using Postgres, it is using SQLite. So we have this create table, if not exists, and I'm actually going to just delete everything else just so we can focus on this one table. So we create the table if it does not exist, and that's memberships. This memberships is going to have an ID and I'm just going to highlight everything with a comma space and then we'll just hit return. And this makes it a bit easier to read. So we have our ID, the room ID, and then we get all the way down to the involvement. And so the involvement is just a string and it has a default of mentions. And so this is pretty cool and I do get the logic, but what I've always done in the past is for something like this, I would have the enum the involvement, and then I would have the different keys. We would have the invisible, and I would give it an actual integer value. Then we would have nothing. I would give it another integer value, mentions, and so forth. You can then add the prefix, and we'll set that to involved in. And so that way you would need strings for the values, and instead you can have a data type of an integer within the database. This does have the problem where now you have magic numbers, within your code and it's tied directly to something in the database. So I think I would actually prefer using the strings instead of specific numbers. But I think it also really just depends on your use case. But overall, I think the logic here is that within your application, if we wanted to change this to just be displayed as not visible or non-visible instead of invisible, then you would be able to make that code change when using integers because nothing is going to change on the database. However, now all throughout your application where you were referring to invisible or the invisibles, if you're scoping, you would have to go through and make all of those changes. And that may not be necessary, but if you're using a string for the data type, I don't think you're going to be able to just make that kind of change without consequences. So again, I think that this is going to be a case by case situation 
where yes, you do have magic numbers, but you are able to change your code without making any changes on the database. Or you can use strings, but now you're basically locked into these and you would have to make data changes if these ever needed to change. If there's anything else within Campfire that you're interested in, then please let me know because I would like to cover those as well. I do plan on looking into the JavaScript a lot more and how they're approaching some of these stimulus controllers because those are pretty interesting as well. But in this episode, I wanted to mainly focus on the Ruby side of things. Well, that's all for this episode. Thanks for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.